So we're going to continue on in our study of the snapshots from a spiritual journey. And as I've already indicated, uh, we're going to look at the snapshot that God actually leads in mysterious ways. You ever said that? Man, God works in mysterious ways. God leads in mysterious ways. This passage is really about God's leading. Uh, it's about the exodus. I mean, that's what we're going to take as our example of God's leading. He actually leads his people uh, through the exodus. And by the exodus, we mean the departure from Egypt. All right? But I'm getting just a little ahead of myself here. And uh, so first of all, I want you to look at where in the world they were. We've been talking about this place called Egypt, but we've really never identified it. There's planet Earth. You can see Africa. And you see that little box there. That little box is just going to indicate where my next slide is taking us. We're going to zero in on this region of the world where the story is taking place. And uh, it says uh, here, this is where they were actually coming from. And uh, it says the Israelites went up out of the land of Egypt. And so Egypt, this is that delta plain, is very fertile. The Nile River would overflow with the banks and it became a very fertile area. And uh, population center were, sprung up wherever there were these fertile places. They had been taken into the land of Egypt uh, by a forefather, uh, Jacob, and his son Joseph, when times were good in Egypt. But times, as you recall, turned sour, and uh, they were actually a nation that became enslaved. They were in a very cruel slavery, from uh, a command to drowned even the, every child that was born that was male. Terrible taskmasters put over them. And uh, Moses, at the point when he was called of God to, to go deliver the people, he, said, he asked his father-in-law, Jethro, um, can I go back and see if they even exist? Now, why would that be? Because it was such a fierce and terrible slavery that they were in. Look where they were coming from. All right. Now that I want to parallel this a lot to our own lives. I can also ask myself spiritually, look where I was coming from. We were all coming from a sort of bondage and slavery. Because the scriptures tell us that wherefore is by one man sin entered into the world, death by sin. So death passed upon all men for all have sinned. I was born enslaved to disobedience to God. Did you ever notice you don't have to teach a child how to do bad? <laughs> and it's a struggle to teach them to do good. It's because we are by nature fallen. Adam fell, we all suffer the consequences. Why? We are a race. And so when Adam fell, every one of us fell. The human race fell. There is a second Adam, Christ, so that all in the first Adam die, all in the second Adam live. Now I was born physically as a descendant of Adam enslaved. I didn't want to be in slavery. I just was born that way. I was a slave to my nature. I was a slave to sin. I, and I was in bondage. So I by nature did bad things. Just the way it works. So I need a new birth. And that's what Jesus said. You must be born again. When you are born again, you're born as in Adam, all die. So in Christ, I'm born in Christ. By the Spirit of God, I'm born again. All are made alive. And so I need not just the first birth, I need a second birth. Well, they were coming out of their bondage. They were leaving their slavery in Egypt and trying to leave that behind. Now, I want you to notice where they were going. All right? It says they were going to a good land. Now, I got the good land highlighted up there in the, in the yellow. And uh, it says it's a good land flowing with milk and honey. Uh, we call this the promised land. God had promised that he was going to give that land to Abraham back in Genesis chapter 12. In Genesis chapter 15, he enters into a covenant with Abraham and says, Abraham, you fall asleep because what I'm going to do in this covenant, I'm going to pass through the pieces so it's a one-sided covenant. You aren't entering into it. It's one-sided. I'm entering it with you. And I'm going to give you this land, but before you, I give it to you, four generations are going to pass. Now, Abraham was 100 years old when he had his son. 
a generation was a hundred years. So when we get to Genesis chapter 14, verse 30, it says that 400 years have passed since they'd entered the land, exactly 430 years had passed, that they were going to be led out of the land to this good land that God had promised Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. And now they're 400 years being in outside the land. God is now ready to bring them into the land. It says it's a good land that flows with milk and honey. Now when I get to the book of Numbers, they actually go into the land. They send spies into the land. And they, they said, oh, it is a land. It's a good land. It's a spacious land. They, they said it's, and they brought back a cluster of grapes. The cluster of grapes was so large, it took two men to carry them on a, on a stick between them, and they were bringing them back to show it. And he said, but there's only one problem, there are giants in the land. And they got these big cities, and they brought a discouraging report, but God was calling them to go into that land and take possession of what God had given them. They were going from slavery to freedom, from bondage, to a land that flowed with milk and honey. They were going somewhere. Going somewhere. Now, next we notice that uh, how God led them. If you, you notice in the text, when the Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines. The shortcut was, and I got it up on the screen there, it's only like maybe a 10, 14 day journey. Problem is, the, the Hebrews are going to spend the next 40 years trying to get there. <laughs> but God did not lead them the easy shortcut way. This is a really important point. When God leads us, He doesn't always lead us through the shortcuts. He doesn't always lead us through the easy path. It's, it's very rarely my way. Because I want everything the least painful approach. How about you? I kind of tell God how he should be leading me. And then say, God, how come it's not going according to my plans? Because God says, here, no, no, I'm not leading you the shortcut way. And it's God in here says, because they haven't learned something. He says here in the text, if the people face war, they may change their minds and return to Egypt. All they go, although they go out like an army, they're not battle ready. And when they get to the land, they're not going to be battle ready to take and conquer the land. So God is saying, I've got to teach you a few things before I can give you the promised land. I'm a typical America, American. I want everything and I want it right now. I had a child, my, my youngest son, uh, Jeremy, that, I don't know, sometimes I said, what is wrong with this child? He'd be crying because he wanted a bottle. Well, we had this new invention, you know, a microwave oven. You could put the bottle in there and warm it up in a heartbeat. I mean, you know, less than a minute. You would think that he would have learned that the moment that you put it in there and you push the button, that, ah, it's about to come. No, he just screamed all the more for that bottle. <laughs> he wanted it and wanted it right now. And that's the way we are. We want it, want it right now. God says, no, 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 no. I know a good example of this. 20 years ago, I pulled in a parking lot and I prayed that God would make me the pastor of this church. <laughs> I wanted it then, and God said, no, not now, not now. You've got to learn a few things that you'll bring to the church when you come. You see, God leads and where he leads is not always the simple route, the shortcut, the easy, the uncomplicated. It's not always that way. That does not mean that he's not leading. He is very much leading. The text tells us that he is leading. No, God led his people in the roundabout way toward the Red Sea. So they're making their way in the roundabout way. It's not a straight shot. And they're not going to conventional wisdom or my wisdom, it's the way God wants them. And the Israelites went out and they were prepared. They, they, they went out. And, and so as God was leading them, it said that he also led them as a, a pillar of cloud by day. It was a big, visible cloud. He went by day in front of them uh, as a pillar of cloud. And then by night, the text tells me, 
that it became a pillar of fire. So that he could, they, God could lead his people by day or by night. God was always going before them and leading the path. I am amazed. Because the same cloud leads them through the whole wilderness for 40 years. Leads them into the promised land. We're going to learn a little bit more about this cloud. When uh, they set up the tabernacle, the cloud would come on it. If the cloud left it, that meant take down the tabernacle, pack up, we're moving out. And then they would follow the cloud. When it stopped, they would don't put the tabernacle underneath it because God's throne, the Ark of the Covenant, was there. So for 40 years they do this. They got about, I don't know, 10 years of conquering the land, then they go in and they set up the tabernacle for, for the next several hundred years, the cloud is there. Solomon builds a temple, the cloud comes in and fills the place with glory, the cloud was there. It's not until you get to the book of Ezekiel that the cloud actually lifts off. So nearly 700 years, God led them with a cloud, with a cloud. Wouldn't it be so easy if there was a cloud? You go out in the parking lot, oh, there's my cloud. They say, oh, oh, he's telling me, right, where, which restaurant to go to eat today? You say, that would be so easy. Now, here's something really interesting. The cloud. Jesus went up into heaven after his resurrection in a cloud, all right? Now, 40 days later, 50 days, Pentecost. The Holy Spirit comes as a flame of fire. Something happens here, and I believe this. I think that was the glory, kind of glory cloud that took him up into heaven, and God sent that little fire, representing the Holy Spirit, saying, I have given you someone to lead you. In fact, Jesus said, after I leave, I'll send Spirit of God is within me. I rely on the Holy Spirit. How could all those people have rebelled seeing the cloud every day? How do I rebel having the Spirit of God within me? His Spirit bears witness with the Word of God upon me and convicts me and guides me and directs me. It's the, it's the Spirit of God lighting up the Word of God so that I know what is the will of God. He led them in the cloud. The next thing, look at what was in the way. They're leaving the land of bondage, going to the place of promise. And God is leading him, but not the easy way. He's leading him in a more complicated way. And, and they find themselves, finally, they, they run into a wall. It's not a brick wall. It's a wall of water. Approximately 2 million people need to cross the Red Sea. Look what was in the way. There are things that are in our way of getting to where God wants us to be. Isaiah, in his book, chapter 59, says, Your sins have separated between you and your God. When I have something in my life that God is not pleased with, that separates me from where God wants me to be. And so they've got this body of water, the Red Sea, and I've got whatever it is in my life that is my Red Sea. It's the obstacle keeping me from getting where I need to be for God. It's in the way. Now, they had something physical and tangible in the way. And besides that, look who was pursuing them. The text goes on that uh, Pharaoh and his officer said, oh, wait a minute, I think we've made a big mistake here. Who's going to serve us if we leave, let all of our slaves go? Who's going to build our cities? Who's going to work, work in our homes? And who's going to take care of the fields? Who's going to watch our cap? Who's going, who's, we're going to have to do all the work. So they get a change of mind. In fact, it says his heart was hard. God hardened Pharaoh's heart. And it says, and the, the Egyptians pursued them. Pharaoh, his horses, his chariots, his army. And they overtook them. They catch up with them. And so as they drew near, the Israelites now look back towards Egypt. And there they see that the 
Egyptian army is pursuing them, now they are really in a pickle. The question is, what could they do? If they go to the north, come on, they're on horses. The enemy's on horses, you're on foot. They're in chariots and they got all their, their weapons of war. He's got his 600 best charioteers pursuing them. If they go to the south, they're going to get caught. If they turn around, go right back to they're just heading right back to slavery. What could they do? That's the same kind of question we have to ask ourselves. I've got obstacles in my life, usually self placed there because of my disobedience to God. And I've got my own Red Sea blocking the way to getting where God wants me to be. And uh, so what do I do? The first thing is I try to figure out for myself how I'm going to fix this. But in the end, you know what we say? I pray and then I say, I can't believe God actually did that. If we would just start with Him instead of with us, they could do nothing at this point. Moses said to the people, because watch what they did. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. Stand firm. And see the deliverance that the Lord will accomplish for you. I like the King James Version better here. Stand still. Stop in your tracks. And see the salvation of the Lord. Stand still. When it comes to salvation, most people are trying to earn their salvation. They're trying to make themselves good enough. They're trying to make their good outweigh their bad. They're trying to do something themselves, but the Bible says it's not of works. You just got to stand still, not in what you have done, but in what the Lord has done. He says, stand still. And now look what God did. The Lord will fight for you. You only have to keep still. Stand still. This is the hardest thing in the world to do. You want to do something. And God says, no. I will do it. I will do it. It's very humbling to, be, to have to say, I, I can't do anything. There's nothing I can do. Lord, you have to do this. It's humbling. Look what God did. He said, hey, I will fight for you if you just stand still. And the angel who was before the Israelite uh, <clears throat> before, was going before them. He moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud moved from in front of them and took a place behind them. So the pillar that was leading them sweeps around and is now between the Israelites and the Egyptian. And then here's an interesting part of the, the text. It goes on and it says, It came between the army of, of the Egyptian and the army of Israel. And so the cloud was there with darkness and it lit up the night. That one cloud at the same time cast darkness on the Egyptians. It was a bright light to the Israelites. So the Israelites could do everything they needed to do for the next step of the journey while the, the Egyptians were all in total darkness, couldn't do anything. Now this is the most mysterious thing in the whole world to me. God works in mysterious ways. God leads in mysterious ways. I, I'll tell you the one I see most practically in my life, in, in our lives, is the whole thing that you can't outgive God. It makes no sense to give a tithe but when you give a tithe, God works in mysterious ways to bring that all back to you, plus usually more. And if you test them with even more, you watch. God works in such mysterious ways. The cloud was both light and darkness. God was stepping in. And then the next thing it says, the Lord said to Moses, stretch, stretch out your hand over the sea. And the Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind. I don't know how this all worked out. 
I sometimes mentally play these games. What could have this, how could this have happened? Could God have diverted one of the jet streams to come straight down? <laughs> All right? So I, and just blown that water. So it's, well, then I said, well, how do they walk across? Because that's a pretty strong jet stream, you know? Uh, that would have just been blowing them all over the place, too. I finally come up, this God does something incredibly miraculous. As Christians, we believe in the doctrine of divine providence. Providence means God is operating his universe. If I throw this clicker up in the air, it will come down. And if I said why, you'd say the law of gravity. That is partly correct. The real answer is God normally operates our universe so that when I throw this up, it comes down. In providence, he works all things after the council as well. Here's another one. Normally, when a person dies, they stay dead. That's the way God providentially works his universe. But there are the miraculous. There are cases where Jesus raised the dead, including Lazarus. Jesus himself was raised from the dead. God is working in his universe in an extraordinary way. Normally, water lays flat. Even when the wind blows over it, normally it lays flat. <laughs> it may make a wave, but it lays flat. In this case, the waters were parted. The wind blew and dried the ground. That's what the text says. <laughs> so that they could walk across on dry land. The waters were divided. Now imagine that you're there. You see these waters divided. The way of escape now is just one way of escape. You can't go back. If you go to the north, you go to the south. All you can do is go east through the water. <laughs> imagine you're there and you're walking down through the waters. That would take great faith. I, I can imagine these wa walls of water are a little rocky, you know, and it's coming back and forth. I can imagine a few, uh, a little mist coming off of them. You get a little spray. You ever been by Niagara Falls? <clears throat> I'm standing at the edge of Niagara Falls, the very closest point you should get, looking over. And my brother Ed comes up behind me, grabs me and picks me up just a little bit, pulls me down and says, oh, I saved you. <laughs> my heart was racing, you know. And, uh, can you imagine walking through every step is a step of faith. <clears throat> that God is going to hold these walls of water from collapsing on you. See, that's what faith is. It's not a cakewalk. It's a faith walk. Step by step. Where he is leading, where he is directing, and you just take a step at a time. I notice he didn't <clears throat> remove the Red Sea. The Red Sea was there. He just made a path through it. I don't know what your obstacle in life is right now. He has not said he's going to remove it, but he has said he will go with you through it. Some way he'll part your obstacle so that you can get through it when you take the faith walk. The faith walk. The faith walk. So the Israelites went on, on dry ground and the waters were a wall to them and on the right. And the text goes on then and says, now look what happened to the Egyptians. The Egyptians see that the Israelites have gone through. And they're going, arriving on the other side. <clears throat> and they say, work for them, works for us. Off they go down. And it doesn't work that way. You can never get to the other side of someone else's faith. I'll tell you right now. You cannot, you, you won't go to heaven because your mom and dad were Christians. You have got to believe in Christ yourself. You won't go to heaven because your children are Christians. No, you're going to have to believe yourself. No one gets a free ride at someone else's faith. You have to believe for yourself. The Egyptians did not believe. They go running right down into the water. And when the Egyptians pursued them into the sea, it says they went in after them that the waters returned and covered the chariot so that not one of them remained. He that believes on the Son is not condemned, but he that believes not is condemned already because he has not believed on the name of the only begotten Son of God. You'll never get anywhere on someone else's faith. Even if it's your husband or your wife's faith, you won't get anywhere. You 
must believe for yourself. Because we will all give an account for ourselves when we stand before God. Not one of you are going to be able to point your finger and say, Pastor Henderson didn't tell me. You have to believe in yourself. What would happen to them? Meanwhile, it says, the Israelites walked on dry ground through the water, forming walls on the right and on their left. God leads in mysterious ways. That's all I can say he does. He certainly does. He took them through a path and that was really mysterious. And as I've been saying, God's leading is not a cakewalk. If you think that if God leads you, it's going to get simpler, you got to, you got some, i got some bad news for you. It's not going to happen that way. When God leads, it doesn't always get simple. It sometimes is more complicated because he wants you to learn something bigger and greater to trust him. It's not a cakewalk. It's a faith walk. I notice this, that when you have faith, that faith delivers, that faith saves, because it's, it's got an object of God in the Lord Jesus Christ. It saves you from your past. They were saved from slavery. When I accepted Jesus Christ, I was saved from all my past, all of it. I was saved from all my guilt. It's also a faith that delivers in the present. I don't know what obstacle you have in your, your life right now. It could be in a relationship obstacle. It could be with a son or daughter, a mother or father. It could be, I, it could be a work-related obstacle. It could be financial. I, I don't know what your, it could be a physical thing. I don't know what your obstacle is that's out there. But he will deliver you through that when you trust in him by faith. Listen, faith delivers for a future. God says, I know the plans I have for you. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope, to give you a future. And even if I die, I go to be in heaven. I go to be in heaven with the Lord forever. And so I have a future because I have faith. Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Not a cake walk, it's a faith walk. I want you to take this with you. It's just the final verses of the passage. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the Egyptians. Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great work that the Lord had did against the Egyptians. So that the people feared the Lord and believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. In the book of Hebrews, New Testament, reflecting back on this. It says, by faith the people passed through the Red Sea as if it were dry, dry land. But when the Egyptians attempted to do so, they were drowned. There was only one way, and that one way had to be done through faith. In the New Testament, it's the exact same story. There is only one way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. It's a one way. It's a faith way. It's a faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He delivers from the past, the present, and in the future, you'll be with him forever. It's a faith way. It's a faith way. Father in heaven, we're thankful for the story found in the Old Testament that points us to the fact there's only one way. You're leading us and pointing us to Jesus Christ. We who know him and have accepted him as our Savior have had all of our sins forgiven. We are on our way to heaven. Daily when obstacles arise, when we trust in him, he's promised he will never leave us nor forsake us. He will part the problem and go with us through it so that we are delivered on the other side, achieving that which you want us to, to achieve, even in this life. Savior said he'd come to give us an abundant life and we know that's it. Living life to the full, walking in harmony with our God, step by step, in faith with Jesus, both now and forevermore. Lord, if there's someone here who does not know Jesus, right now I pray they lift up in their heart saying, Lord, I want to receive you as my Savior today. Save me, Lord Jesus. I know you will, Lord. 
you are in the saving business. Thank you for what you will do. Christ's name.